Great. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me this evening. A uh, great pleasure to see you. Let me just uh, get my opening slide and then we will crack on. Um, Right, I assume that that is now, you're all able to see that. Is that is that right? If somebody just pops something in the comment to say, yes, that would just help me. Um, fine, well, look, and delighted to see so many people from all over the country this evening. Um, as I understand it, uh, somewhere in the region of um, 140 people registered and lots and lots of people from all over the country, from right up in Scotland, I see from Fife and Aberdeen. Shire. Wonderful to see you all. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you about these pretty blue butterflies you see here on screen and how by understanding how to return these blues to the gardens, parks and other amenity grasslands in Eastbourne that we can not only look after them but also a host of other wildlife and especially wildflowers and insect pollinators. And I, I want to, to leave you this evening, I think, with a sense of optimism based on the practical examples of what's worked elsewhere. This really is a talk about how to rebuild biodiversity. Now, um, what's um, what's different here is that you, the well, indeed the good townsfolk of Eastbourne, want to do this throughout the town. And I know of nowhere else wanting to do it at this scale. And I strongly believe that this will be a successful venture because if everybody does something, then you really can build a network of high quality habitats throughout the town, which these butterflies, they will respond to and they will colonize as a result. Now, I'm Phil Sterling. Um, I've got a lifetime interest in butterflies and moths. And for 30 years, I've been involved in practical schemes to create wildlife habitats out of, well, nothing, bare ground. Um, and uh, much of my experience comes from my time working in local government in Dorset, um, where I still live, and from uh, habitat creation on the back of roads and uh, landfill restorations, mineral sites, and indeed, um, for a while, I was also in charge of the road verge management throughout the county and uh, was able to change the approach to road verge management, which I know so many people across the country want to see and, and was able to put in place different practices which genuinely lead to saving money and delivering wildlife. Um, I now work for the charity Butterfly Conservation on a national program promoting what I've learnt, and that program is called Building Sites for Butterflies. Right, so um, tonight, let's see, what, what I want to do is just to give you my running order, why butterflies matter, you know, what's special about Eastbourne, um, why existing amenity grasslands aren't really any good for wildlife, what, what we're doing that we what we shouldn't be doing, understanding, giving a bit of an explanation as to, to how to improve them, and then some real practical examples of how we can, each and every one of us in our own little way can make a difference, and then counting the benefits, how do we monitor what's going on. So, why do butterflies matter? Why have I shown you five blues there? Well, there are a variety of reasons, but the one I like most is that uh, butterflies are actually very visible signs of how our natural environment is faring. They are that kind of easily recognizable symbols of a functioning environment. So when we read the stats about how badly they're doing, that they're in decline, it is telling us that we're not looking after our environment well. And the reverse is also true. So when they're common and we see them all the time, I think we, we, can, we can take pride in what we've done to help them on their way. And our green spaces these days um, are or, or should be much more than mown grass and lollipop trees, which I think is what we tend to associate with our kind of town parks. Um, we need them to perform lots of different functions these days um, if we ourselves are to thrive in our communities. And, and this slide just shows you um, a few of the functions that we want our green spaces to 
achieve these days. You know, and, and clearly tonight I'm talking about biodiversity and poll pollination. Um, but there's also that sense of place. You know, you're in Eastbourne. We want to do things in Eastbourne. Eastbourne is not somewhere else. Eastbourne has all the characteristics of the geology and the surroundings that it has that make it special, that make it unique. And so we want in carrying out this habitat work to, 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 to enhance that sense of place and pride in, in its being. And of course, we all want better health and well-being, particularly after this most extraordinary year that we're all living through at the moment. So what's special about Eastbourne and its butterflies? Well, it's the town's geographical position, surrounded by some very special natural environments where these butterflies are already thriving. So just to give you a bit of an introduction, we've got uh, on the left the Adonis and the Chalk Hill Blues. Now, these are both specialists of chalk downlands um, and are found on the coast, really, from Seaford to Beachy Head, from, uh, from west to east. Then there's the small blue just to the right of the middle. This is our, but our smallest British butterfly. This can also be found on the chalk downland, but uh, is also found wherever the food plant of this butterfly occurs. And I'll be talking more about that in a bit. And then on the right hand side, a brown argus and common blue butterfly. These are much more widespread species and they probably are already in the town as breeding species to some extent. But basically, we're not making their lives very easy for them. And um, that's what I want to see. I want to get these, these, give these blues a chance to invade from the surrounding countryside. And um, I couldn't resist the uh, Dad's Army Arrows, as we're in the land of the fictitious Wilmington on Sea, of course. And apologies to all those who've tuned in to a too young to know about that uh, classic comedy TV series. So, um, what? What's making it so hard for these butterflies and indeed for a lot of wildlife to kind of invade and colonize our um, uh, our towns to get a foothold on our amenity grasslands? Well, it's pretty obvious, really. It is actually the way that we manage our grasslands and indeed the way we design them. So um, on the left is a typical mown lawn, and I'm sure many of us who uh, lucky enough to own gardens, have probably got a very proud green grass that we continue to mow. And on the right is a more typical local government managed piece of amenity grassland where there isn't sufficient money to look after it um, in the way that perhaps it was 30, 40 years ago. And so when the grass does get cut, it sits there and goes brown and it's pretty unappealing. It looks a bit of a mess and nobody really uses it for the purpose for which it was designed for walking in. So overall, it wouldn't come as any surprise to anybody listening in tonight to know that those two photographs are supporting well the wildlife underneath there virtually nothing there's 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 not there's barely a flower in sight maybe a couple of daisies if you look really hard so that's not much good and that comes down to how we design our our green spaces is that we've tended to every time we go and design them we put in a load of topsoil on top of whatever the mineral or the subsoil is beneath. And it tends to be 150 millimetres that goes on to every garden, every open space, every road verge. And then it gets sown with a, an amenity grassland mix, which contains a lot of ryegrass. And almost none of that has got anything to do with wildlife at all. We're planting grasses that aren't much good and there's no space for the wildflowers. And so that's that's the kind of the reason why most towns across Britain are impermeable to butterflies and particularly some of these blue butterflies is because there's no space for their for their um, food plants to thrive and there's not enough nectar sources that we're providing for them to to live on as adults. So how do we change this? Well, soil fertility is everything. Um, I think we think, tend to think, is that oh, we make a, a site more fertile, we can grow more flowers in it. It's actually the reverse. And if you look at this slide here, on the left is, well, these, these two slides are exactly the same road verge, just 100 metres apart. And this is just down from my house in Weymouth. And this was a scheme that I was involved in, in helping. Um, and um, uh, on the left is a, is a verge that's, um, that's got... Uh, 
uh, a decent 150 mil of topsoil and this is a photograph taken in April and the grass has grown long because it's early spring and exactly the same will be true in lots of places in Eastbourne. On the right hand side 100 meters away is a place where my colleagues engineering colleagues ran out of topsoil so they just scattered the seed on on whatever was there and look at the difference as soon as you've got low fertility you've got hardly any grass growth but look at the other difference there are lots of daisies now i know daisies are not the common and well, not the rarest wildflower on the planet but the point is is that is showing us about everything we need to know that as soil fertility decreases there are more gaps for germination and our wildflowers are able to thrive because those grasses are not competing and smothering and choking the wildflowers so effectively high biodiversity the way nature designed it is is by having low fertility grasslands so our very best grasslands for wildflowers are those that thrive on the on and grow on the poorest soils and poor soils really means low nitrogen and those are the wildflowers we really want to see. So all those big competitor thuggish things like coarse grasses, coxfoot grass and false oak grass and docks and thistles, they can't survive uh, as well in these really nutrient poor conditions because they can't suck up that nutrient and, and, um, and smother the wildflowers. So they all get a chance to thrive. So if we want high biodiversity, we want low fertility. And the very best time that I found to uh, experiment with that, well, I say experiment, actually put it into practice on a big scale. And I grant that this is not the sort of scale that we'll be looking at in, in, in Eastbourne. But you know, hear me out. This example provides you with the, the base plan of, what, of, what, of why low fertility works. So here's a new road verge. Can, this was constructed as part of the Weymouth Relief Road back in 2009 to 2011. And, and uh, I specified hardly any topsoil at all, just a tiny scattering of a few millimetres. That was all. And onto that, I hand sewed a selected um, uh, wildflower mix. And in, in the selection of those, those were pretty much our native wildflowers, perennials and one or two species in there which which I call pioneer species those species which love to grow quickly and early and flower profusely and the effect can be quite dramatic so there we go and there is the flower that's probably the most prolific that comes up most early and that is the yellow flower of kidney vetch kidney vetch should be an abundant species all over britain but somehow we've managed to eradicate it exterminate it spray it do whatever we can to get rid of it and it's a real shame it's a beautiful wildflower found from all the way from the from the south tip of cornwall down on the lizard all the way out to the outer hebrides it should be absolutely everywhere but isn't but it's a special, special plant because it hangs on to one of our five blues, the small blue. And kidney vetch is the only food plant for this species. So because the food plant is disappearing, so is the butterfly. And the point is, in order to bring this butterfly back, we need to be spreading the food plant. And it's really not a lot more difficult than that. But we need to spread it in those low fertility conditions. Right. So next, so here, here's a picture, Ten. this is the same road verge that you looked at in the last shot, but 10 years on. Now look at it, this is a photograph taken this uh, end of May, early June, and it's now an absolute carpet of pyramidal orchids, along with all the kidney vetch and the bird's foot trefoils and all the other things that we want. And it's, 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 it's starting to show us that these low fertility verges are really important for wildflowers. There's 141 species on these verges that have appeared in 10 years. And remember, I only sowed under 30 species. So this is a really powerful way of recreating biodiversity very, very quickly by having low fertility conditions. And better than that, 30 species of butterfly have now been recorded on these banks, including, well, there's the other four of our blue species that we're after. So these were agricultural fields before we built the road and then we put the verges in did the right thing with the verges with no topsoil low fertility soils and 
pretty quickly all of these five blue species have turned up. Now I can hear you say, well, that's all very well. It's all because it's in Weymouth and the scale of it and all the rest of it. How can we achieve this on a smaller scale? Well, I'll come to that. So what do we want to do in Eastbourne? How are we going to do this? Well, there are just a few key do's and don'ts that I want to go through. And then I'm going to look to the practical habitat creation in school grounds and public parks, changing how we do manage the road verges and open spaces. And then for anybody who owns gardens, how we transform gardens. So in terms of the key do's and don'ts, um, uh, well, we've already learned this evening that, that to get more wildflowers throughout the town, we have to find ways to reduce soil fertility. But two things we must not do, and that's just stop mowing. If you've got currently fertile soil conditions and you stop mowing, you end up with, well, most people might describe what they see in this slide as a mess. Certainly those who have to look after the parks and open spaces and the road verges would probably call it that. And their, their kit, their equipment would not be able to mow it. The grass grows very long. Yes, there are wildflowers in there, but it's, it's really hard to maintain when it gets out of hand. So I'm not after that, and I do not want you to create that. But if you reduce the fertility, you will not get that. The other thing that I'm not talking about is what you saw, think back to the London Olympics, and, and outside the Olympic Park, those that amazing spectacle of, of, uh, of, of well, what were termed wildflowers. It's a pictorial meadow mix, and most of those species are not native to this country. Um, and of those that are, most of them are very rare, and there's hardly any species in that sort of mix that a butterfly will take one look at. Possibly the Rudbeckia in there, some of the brown butterflies might like to take some nectar from. But that's about it. And, and if you ever thought that poppy was a very important species in this country for wildlife, think again. There is not one single butterfly that takes one slight bit of notice of poppy. And it's not even a native species. It's a species that was introduced here a long time ago with agriculture from southeastern Europe. So there are some things we must do and some things we must not if we're genuinely going to encourage these butterflies. I grant you that these pictorial meadow mixes look wonderful and they lift our spirits. But please don't go away this evening thinking that they're the best thing for wildlife because they're not. Right. So how about the things that I would like you to do? Well, habitat creation, school grounds and public parks and open spaces. This does not have to be on the scale of the Weymouth Relief Road to be effective. And so what I'm looking at is for is for places to come forward and say we can create butterfly banks and butterfly banks are basically piles of chalk or subsoil where there is no fertility or very low fertility where we can grow the wildflowers that these blue butterflies like. And I'll come back to that. So what we're after is genuinely a little sketch plan but just you can work out how many materials you need, what the cost's going to be, make sure that people are happy that it's going to happen. But it's a very simple construct of, of, of taking away a bit of the topsoil and bringing in some chalk or exposing the subsoil beneath. That, it's, it's no more complicated than that. But if there were, I don't know, 10 of those created across Eastbourne in, in parks and school grounds, then, then that would make a very big difference to the stepping stones for these butterflies to get through the town. And construction, very simple, just a mini digger to spread out, I don't know, 20 or 40 tons of chalk onto, onto the ground. The bank, by the way, is not critical. Here, the bank has been created by the topsoil that's been scraped up and then covered in, in chalk. But you don't have to have a bank. You can have a flat butterfly bank. It works just as well from the butterfly point of view. And then you can, um, you can well, here's, here's an example of where we've um, taken away the topsoil. And, and this is the subsoil that we're creating into, the, into that low fertility area. And both these examples that I've just shown you are from schools in New Addington in uh, South Croydon in London, where we've been working on them over the summer this year. And, um, and, and again, to, to create these stepping stones in the community for butterflies. 
and um, and here's some of the community that got involved in this one at uh, Fairchild School in New Addington, um, primary school kids who've been growing wildflowers. Now, just uh, you can see there, rabbit fencing may be needed. It's just possible some of these sites may need to be fenced against rabbits if there is a real population of rabbits around. Now, the wildflowers, I said I'd come back to those. Growing wildflowers is a good kind of community spirited thing to do, but we need to grow the right wildflowers. And for these blue butterflies, we need to choose their food plants. That is the food plants of the caterpillars that need that need to be planted out on these banks. Then the female butterflies can find them and lay their eggs and the life cycle goes on. And we're not talking about lots here. We're talking about three species in particular. Common bird's foot trefoil, which is one of the main food plants for common blue. Kidney vetch, which you've already seen is the food plant of, for the sm small blue. And then horseshoe vetch for the Adonis blue and chalk hill blue. Of all of those, horseshoe vetch is the only one which has really to be grown in chalk in order to survive in the long term. It will come up on other soils, but it tends to fade after about 10 years. So probably not a lot of point in planting horseshoe vetch in deep clay, but the other two species will love it. So a really good thing to be doing for, for kids, for parents, for community groups to be growing wildflowers and planting these out on the banks. And here's an example of a successful bank. Um, this is Dorothy Springer School, not that far from you, just down the road in Brighton. Um, this is one created in the mid 2000s. And um, I think there are, there are over 30 species of butterfly that have been seen in this area. And certainly all five of the blue species uh, have been seen in and around and are probably breeding on these uh, on these uh, chalk butterfly banks that have been created. So we know close by in Eastbourne that this can be a success. Now, the next thing I want to move is to, uh, so that's our, that's our schools and open spaces. I really want to, to get you to think about where you can create butterfly banks. The next is, is I'll canter through changing how grass and road verges and open spaces are cut. Not something that, um, that, that you know, necessarily you have any control over, but, um, but it's something where you could put some pressure on the local authority, whether that's Eastbourne Council or others. Uh, and, and I've spoken with Eastbourne Council staff and they're very keen to change. It's just that they're priorities are probably elsewhere at the minute. So um, uh, we, we if we change from a, a cut and drop mowing, which is the standard prescription for mowing that's been going on for decades, to a cut and collect, or if you're up in Scotland, cut and lift, um, where the um, um, uh, the, uh, the the grass is um, is allowed to grow, and then as it grows, you take away that grass. You take away the fertility that the grass has drawn up from the soil below. And if you do that frequently enough in the first year, then very very quickly the quality of the uh, of of that lush grass disintegrates, disappears, and you end up creating those low fertility conditions where wildflowers can thrive. And not only that but there's less, less grass to cut, so actually there are cost savings involved in it. And after three years of cut and collect, here's a photograph of an ordinary road verge in the middle of Blandford in Dorset, of which the, you know, Blandford and Eastbourne must be fairly similar in terms of the types of verges that occur there, built on kind of chalky soils. This is a photograph taken late October, and that verge was last cut in the middle of June or towards the end of June. It's required no management since then. So this fertility reduction really works. And you can see a few bits of um, wildflower coming in there, but, um, but that was in October and it's mainly uh, yarrow. However, these low fertility verges can look spectacular. So here's one this year from Weymouth. And these are all common wildflowers, but they were never sown there. They've arrived in of their own accord um, just as a result of reducing the fertility through cut and collect mowing. And now these verges, which are just in the middle of the Weymouth on clay soils, uh, are, are abundant and with wonderful wildflowers and have no concern to, to, to traffic from a visibility point of view. And, and I think they look very neat and tidy. Others might disagree. Um, after five years of cut and collect on a chalky verge, you've got every chance of producing something very good indeed. And uh, the Weymouth, uh, no, this is the Blandford bypass, the A354 Blandford bypass used to be cut three times a year. 
now cut in only once on a cut and collect. That's it. That's all the management it gets. So full of wildflowers is it now that the Dorset Wildlife Trust have declared it as a county wildlife site. Um, that just shows you the power of being able to you know, change the mowing regime to add back the wildlife and save money. And, and in an amenity area where there aren't already the wildflowers and maybe the land was formed from um, uh, agricultural soils where there are no wildflower seeds in there, you can, after the cut and collect, just introduce the wildflowers and therefore create the right environment for them to, to come up and not, and not look ridiculously tall. So here is some cut and collect it took place in 2017. The wildflower seed was sown at the end of that year and 18 months later, these look like mini nature reserves in those, those are many triangles of otherwise gang mown grassland that would exist. Note here how my old teams have gone around and effectively framed these little wildflower patches. So we like to create that neat and tidy image, but, but beyond that, the wildflowers can take their place. Now, so that's that's a little bit on on road verges, and and I would encourage you, anybody who's who's got an opportunity to talk to Eastbourne Council, saying you've heard about the changes to road verges, and I will be very happy to help the borough make those changes next year. Now, here's an area where kind of some people dread to step, and me too, really. Gardening for butterflies and moths. We've all got our own views about what a garden should and shouldn't be. So what I'm going to do now is to talk to you about some uh, so just some suggestions. I'm not telling you how you should or shouldn't manage this, but I hope you'll be able to take something from this that might enable you to um, think again about how you look after all of your garden if you're lucky enough to have one. So um, most of us, and myself included, create what we call nectar bars. So we're very good at planting the sorts of um, beautiful flowers that we like to see that butterflies will also visit. Now, clearly Buddleia and Verbena bonariensis, this um, purple Verbena, a very popular um, uh, uh, flowers that attract butterflies. But while they may occasionally have the old blue butterfly on them, there's, they're not food plants of these blues. So if the blues do come along, they're just transitory. They're just moving on. That's not really creating habitats in our gardens for these butterflies to thrive. But what we can do is, um, is, is change the way that we manage all or part of our grass lawns, for instance, and, and see what the difference is. And what I would suggest is that if you're able to, um, choose a sunny patch on your lawn and just stop mowing and see what happens. This picture here is of, of a lawn in my mother's house and um, she's now in her 90s and and I just encourage the gardener not to mow a particular patch for a while and this was last last summer. The, the, the lawn has been mown for the last 30 odd years at least as far as I can remember but when you stop mowing you just see just how many wildflowers there are and so there's common bird's foot trefoil and there's ladies bed straw and there are already common blue butterflies now breeding in that garden where they never were before because they never had a chance to nectar and lay eggs and that was just a relaxation in mowing so for some people their lawns already in Eastbourne will be full of wildflowers that have just never had the chance to flower and set seed and allow the butterflies and other pollinators in so go and have a look and see what's already in there but in my garden, I've, I've, I've gone and bought plug plants or grown them from seed and put them into the garden, into the lawn. And then you can just relax that mowing. And uh, Plant Life, um, a plant charity, they uh, in the last year have been suggesting no mow May. As in, please don't mow in May and go out and count the wildflowers that you see and see how many pollinators there are. My view is it will be even better if you had no mow May to August. So over that summer period, which is the main activity season, just don't mow between May and August. And then you can do it either side of that, but just allow those wildflowers to see and just find out what's there. Go and sit down and watch what happens over lunchtime and see on a sunny lunchtime whether you can see butterflies coming in and enjoying your patch. And there's um, there's a, a in the front garden of my mother's um, mother's garden there it's underneath the trees but they've got black medic and um, and germander speedwell in abundance 
there's no need to mow that. That's not been mown for a month. There's no need to do anything. And it's beautiful, beautifully full of wildflowers. So and here's one where this is back in Weymouth now, where um, the, the, the cut and collect regime has, has, has got going. And so this is all common bird's foot trefoil and, and uh, a few yellow daisies uh, where, where they no longer need to mow. It's very neat and tidy. But because the bird's foot trefoil was already there, it now flowers profusely. And there's a colony of small blue butterflies and also brown argus has moved in there. And this is this is Chatsworth House up in Derbyshire. Just put it in there because even the most formal of gardens and show and displays have really got into wildflowers these days. So I would encourage you to find a patch of your garden somewhere in the sunshine where you can uh, go and plant the wildflowers, sow the seed and get the management right to try and encourage these butterflies. Now, what I'd just like to give you just a few more ideas of what I'm doing to um, our own garden here in Weymouth. And and this was a picture, um, I think it was shortly after lockdown. Um, not that I was bored, of course, I'd already got this planned. But basically, I decided that we've got two patches to the garden. Um, in front of the trellis is a formal flower area. Behind the trellis is uh, is, is very definitely for uh, for butterflies and moths and pollinators and the rest of it. This formal area used to have mown grass where you can see sand. We got rid of the grass and planted it with um, with bird's foot trefoil and with chamomile. And you can see the bird's foot trefoil establishing this summer beautiful yellow flowers and um, and and lovely to see. You know, walking down to to fill up the bird feeder um, through lots of bumblebees enjoying that. That was previously strimmed grassland and, and grass of, of very little wildflower value. But uh, between now and next year, as that uh, area fills up with bird's foot trefoil, effectively I've created a bird's foot trefoil lawn rather than a grass lawn. So it's adding masses more pollination potential and the food plant of the common blue butterfly. And there's my first common blue that I recorded on those bird foot trefoil. Not a brilliant shot. It was just a phone shot. Um, but just so nice to see that butterflies can respond very quickly once you've introduced their food plants. Now, what I'm doing um, in, in, uh, on the strimmed patch is just to keep the, keep the place neat and tidy and looking, uh, looking well kept. In the area below the, 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 the trellis, that's an area that I'm setting aside for all sorts of butterflies. And it's very much on a sort of meadow management. So it, it gets a two cut and collects a year, um, which are in the spring, in March. And again, I've just, this is a photograph I took last week, just, I've just taken out half of that long grass. And again, that cut and collect is keeping the fertility down. Um, but what's really important is to leave a patch of the grass. I mean, this is quite a big patch, but you probably wouldn't want to leave that much. But that's what I've done. Um, and that allows all the caterpillars of those non-blue butterflies, which are feeding over winter on grasses, something to eat over the winter. And this year, when I've been sat out at lunchtime in lockdown, watching the butterflies and the birds, those are the species I've recorded in that patch that you're looking at. So that's 19 species of butterfly um, that I've recorded. And you can see there common blue and brown argus and also holly blue and small copper. And of those, I think there are nine species that are breeding in, in that patch. Well, small white and large white are actually breeding just a little bit below on my cabbages. But uh, seven species are almost certainly now breeding on in that patch of ground and that's what four meters by five meters it's a really tiny patch of of, of of lawn really that set aside that nine species of butterfly probably now breeding there they're wonderful to see and quite easily done that patch of grass used to be where um, we exercised the dog and did dog agility on it we've now converted it into a little nature reserve so just been talking about how to how to uh, count up the butterflies that we're seeing. 
um, once you've made these changes, uh, we really do need to know what's happening. And the easiest way to do this is to uh, go online and um, look out under Butterfly Conservation's Garden Butterfly Survey. And all the details are there of how you count and when you count. But basically, we're really, really interested in those people who want to make a difference and to, particularly from this evening, is to encourage the breeding butterflies into their gardens. What we're also keen is that um, is that you get involved in the big butterfly count. Now, this year, this past year, it was from July 17th of July to the 9th of August. Um, next year, it'll be a different date. We don't know when yet, but uh, but keep looking and and, um, and you'll get to hear about when the big butterfly count is. And this is literally to spend 15 minutes in your garden or a park, an open space or somewhere in the countryside and count what you see. And all of the uh, materials you need, the identification charts, are all available. They're all online. They can be downloaded as an app onto your phone. And it's very easy to submit your sightings. Now, all of what I've spoken about this evening, all of that, I've uh, set up a little resources page for you um, on habitat creation and on road verges and on gardening and indeed on recording. It's all there. Um, some of it still needs a little bit of work on it, um, but uh, but certainly by the beginning of next year, the beginning of 2021, there'll be lots of information to enable you to uh, a kind of self-help guide, if you like. But um, but it's not just about self-help because I'm, I'm after this evening, I'm not just disappearing. Um, so, Eastbourne, it is over to you and for all of you who are listening from around the country elsewhere, over to you too, because this sort of approach can and will work anywhere in Britain, anywhere at all. Um, I love the whole town approach of, uh, of, of Eastbourne because I think it's going to be successful. If everybody does a little bit, you will create an enormous amount of habitat and, and the town will become permeable to wildlife. We know those blues are there within your grasp and they're, they're close by and waiting to come into the town, but you have to let them in. If you change, my prediction is that you will have, in five years' time, all five of those blues where you know they are going to be breeding within the town. But um, I look forward to helping you get there. And as soon as I'm allowed to travel back and work with you in 2021, I will be with there to join you to, uh, to help you help you make the difference in Eastbourne. Thank you very much. Oh, and um, if you've enjoyed this presentation, you want to give us a donation, then I'm sure um, Butterfly Conservation, the charity I work for, will be delighted uh, for your donations. And indeed, you might well be able to consider joining the organization. OK, I can see there are lots of questions come in, so I can now, um, I think I'll just stop sharing for the second and I'll see the questions um, in a little bit more detail. OK, um, let me just, if I trawl back to see how many questions there are. Um, let's just go through. Ah. Yes. OK, well, um, oh. when do you do the second mow and do you not kill the caterpillars and the pupae? Well, that's um, that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, the reality is all management of grasslands will have some adverse effects on butterflies and moths. You can't help it. The, the, the trick is to be able to minimize how much management you need to do. So the lower the fertility of the conditions that you create, the less intervention you have to make. So if you if you plant wildflowers into a fertile grassland, you end up with long grass and wildflowers struggling. Any butterflies and moths that do get in there, you've got to clear that away. Otherwise, those wildflowers will disappear because they will get smothered by the at long grass. So under those circumstances, it's really hard not to do anything. I mean, as much as you're trying to encourage the wildflowers, you're having to cut the grasses down in order to maintain those wildflowers. If you create very low fertile conditions, really, really low fertile conditions, 
um, then you'll hardly need to do any management at all. And uh, if you remember back to that photograph of the pyramidal orchids that I showed you on the Weymouth Relief Road, that verge has had no management at all in 10 years. So nothing has gone. There's no mowers at all. That is, that is just how it was when it was laid there. Nothing's happened. Not a machine has been over that. So under those circumstances, no mowing required at all. The butterflies and the moths and their caterpillars and the pupae are all in are all allowed to get on with their life cycles as you, as you would hope they are. So it's all down to fertility as to and and to minimise the amount of intervention that you need to do. So the lower lower the fertility, the less you have to intervene. Right. Um, let me just. Just get up here. So just I'm trying to go through these in sort of chronological order, if that's all right. Um, oh, is a, a video of the Dorothy Stringer this year? Yes, I would love, um, um, uh, Tanya, I'd love a video of the Dorothy Stringer school your um my my email address is on is on the butterfly conservation website and that will be really really good to see because um obviously it's been really difficult to get out and do this um can the resource pages be sent out by email to the participants well i'll hand that one back to um rob palmer on that and i I would imagine it probably can be. I mean, certainly this talk is recorded and you'll be able to watch it again. And obviously the slide will come up with that, but there's no particular reason. And and I can probably send um, a, a PDF with that so it can be sent out. Um, right. So how can I contact you for my garden project? Ha, ah, Nigel. Um, I think yeah. Well, my my details are on the on the um, butterfly conservation website. Um, my email address is there, so so feel free feel free to email me. Um, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, the more I go out there and talk to people, the busier I get. But um, so bear with me if I can't get back to you instantly tomorrow, or or, or after you've written. But uh, but I will be in touch, and and um, you know very happy to to uh, to to help out. Ah, thank you, Ben. Is there uh, a resource that identifies pioneer species per soil type uh, for the non-botanists? Well, that's a very good point. Um, I think there probably isn't, but it's very much something that I want to be drawing up while I'm still doing this project. I mean, I think I, I want to be able to help anybody who's, um, you know, involved in um, project design, the landscape profession, um, one of the schemes I've been involved in uh, just recently is advising the um, approaches to the Silvertown Tunnel, which is a relief tunnel for the Blackwall Tunnel in London. And um, uh, there, um, the landscapers are, are really, really keen to have no amenity grassland whatsoever, but to create what they're calling brownfield land. And so that is effectively um, uh, land with no topsoil at all, just to grow wildflowers for the simple reason is they do not want to have to maintain those open areas uh, for safety reasons any more than they absolutely have to. So I'm coming up with a species list of all of these species, which are, which I think we they would be good for wildlife, but unlikely to be a pain in terms of spreading. The one thing that I would say is that um, when we create these low fertility habitats, there is always a risk of non-native species starting to spread. And I suppose by that I would mean Budlia. We love Budlia, but please keep it in your garden rather than out in the wider countryside um, because it does spread on bare ground and it's very difficult. It does smother some of our wildflowers. Other species that can do that include um, uh, wall cotoneaster, which is, a, which is a bit of a pain. But um, um, that is a resource that I think I will be producing. Um, bear with me, Ben, and, and it, you know, probably early next year that will be available. Um, yeah, so the, the list of resources, I think I'll send a separate to, to Rob Palmer and, and we'll, we'll get that. Uh, three questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Yep, I will look at those. Thank you for letting me know. Um, let's do those Q&A at the bottom. Right. 
unanswered questions 11 right okay um, where would you go for wildflowers uh, wildflower seeds to be sure you get the native ones well that's a very interesting one um, uh, a number of the rep there there are I mean it's very difficult and it's not my job to advertise these companies in particular but there are particularly well-known ones over in East Anglia um, that are very good um, and are just local to me in Weymouth there's one at Osmington um, which I will tell you the name well that's Heritage Seeds um, that's uh, they're very good I mean I think if you've got a concerns about native seeds then the largest most reputable of them all uh, will guarantee their local source and that means they've been locally harvested from fields often from nature reserves or triple SIs across the country so that they can guarantee the provenance so when I was um, working on the Weymouth Relief Road um, uh, the the seed suppliers which were there were two of them um, were able to guarantee that all of the seeds that that I sowed that I hadn't hand collected myself had come from southwest England or closer and a number of them were from Dorset and they were able to list where they'd come from so if you're unsure ask your seed supplier so that they can give you a provenance list that's very much the uh, the best thing to do right uh, where do blue butterflies go in winter and where do they pupate great well um, it depends on the blue butterfly uh, most of them exist over winter um, in the caterpillar form um, having not pupated so so um, uh, some of them will be small caterpillars so if we think about the Adonis blue and the chalk hill blue those are, are, are very small larvae over the winter and they, they feed up in the spring now um, uh, the common blue is a fully fed caterpillar pretty much uh, in the late autumn and then it hibernates on the ground as a caterpillar um, in the in in its cocoon waiting to pupate in the spring and the same is true of the uh, small blue so um, so where do they pupate most of the blues pupate on the ground um, and indeed uh, holly blue which as you probably know is a, is a species that you tend to find in ivy and, and dogwood and holly uh, the caterpillars of those go down onto the ground and and ants tend to protect them and hide them um, but before they pupate and can sometimes even take the pupae underground so uh, so they tend to live on the ground as pupae right next one I uh, know Eastbourne has been selling its arisings for heat capture are local planning authorities aggregating to achieve biomass to fuel recapture to make efficiencies of mowing well the only place I know in the country that is systematically doing that is Lincolnshire and there they are taking their um, uh, uh, grass arisings and feeding them into biodigesters now that's not easy to achieve particularly if there aren't biodigesters in the area um, uh, but I but there are plenty of things that I think we should be doing with woody arisings that the problem comes as to how far you have to take the wood or the grass to achieve the the fuel gain that you want um, because if you have to transport this very low grade material any more than I don't know about five miles the economics don't really work very well okay um, copies of the webinar or well, making natural history has uh, has given you the link to that um, right uh, could I say a bit more about managing tall ruderal herbs uh, response on newly created soils uh, I think Dorothy Stringer school went through this um, uh, yes very definitely um, tall ruderal herbs are, um, are, are very uh, I mean the thing about disturbance that there's this sort of triangle of, of, of stress so so we're after the conditions where you've got bare ground where the plants that survive are really stressed and can cope with that stress so they don't grow very tall and they're after longevity as soon as you disturb the ground you release a whole lot of nutrients 
and seeds and there's an awful lot of stuff going on in the first couple of years. What I would suggest that happens when you get tall ruderal herbs and those could be, they, they could include docks and willow herbs and, and these days um, blue flea, um, no, Canadian fleabane is, a, is, a, is a, um, a non-native species that's spreading all over the place. My suggestion is to go there and be ruthless in the first couple of years if you've got lots of these tall herbs, is to go there in the middle of the summer and cut them down and take them away. Just just cut. You don't need to dig them up. In fact, don't dig them up because that creates more disturbance. What you're after is, is stabilized bearish ground so the wildflowers can get going and thrive. So I would cut them and take them away. And by doing so, you're removing more nutrients and allowing those, those stress tolerant wildflowers to survive. Uh, Wildlife Trust has introduced sheep grazing being uh, common and small blues on it, is this going to cause the blues problems? Um, I think it's unlikely, but it does depend on the uh, amount of grazing. If, if, if hundreds of sheep have been released onto one area during the flowering season that, and, and the animals are struggling to, to eat, then they will eat all sorts of things. But they tend not to like kidney vetch and, and birds for trefoil. So they tend not to like these leguminous plants. Um, they will nibble them, but um, but if you can imagine the caterpillars of the small blue are in the flowers, then if the flowers get eaten, you will lose the small blues. The caterpillars of common blue are on the leaves. So if, if a sheep's nearby, they tend to drop to the ground and are probably less, uh, and they won't be eaten. So they're, they're probably less um, susceptible to overgrazing. Um, but so it's all about when the grazing happens and if the grazing happens kind of outside the main flowering season then there really shouldn't be a problem at all and overall that will be a good thing because it's tending to keep the ground open. Um, um, I've done that for Nigel. Uh, are all the approaches mentioned also beneficial for moths? Um, Yes, by and large, they are. I mean, uh, you know, there are 49 species of breeding butterfly in this country, and there are two and a half thousand species of moth. So, um, understandably, there are going to be niches, habitats where moths occur that butterflies don't. But of the sorts of things that I've been talking about in terms of leaving patches of uh, long grass, of encouraging um, uh, the planting of wildflowers, providing you're planting lots of these uh, native perennial wildflowers and leaving patches of grass and cutting on rotation, you are definitely helping moths. But um, if you think of um, mullein, you know, great mullein plant, the, 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 the one with the big furry leaves that get the mullein moth caterpillars on them. I mean, there's, there are no butterflies associated with mullein, but uh, mullein is actually a ruderal plant. So there are some ruderal plants that I've just been talking about clearing away, which are, of course, good for moths. So, so moths tend to inhabit a wider range of plants and a wider range of habitats than butterflies. But overall, the lower the fertility in grassland situations, the more moths there are. So you can't really go far wrong with that. Right, we have a local verges project pending and may only be able to get the grass cut by the farmer in late summer. The soil is fertile. How long until we have a wildflower meadow? Right. Um, I, look, if, if the grass can only be cut once a year, um, and then taken by the farmer, then that's fine. That, that, that will slowly get there, um, but it will definitely get there. The problem with most road verges, including conservation verges in Britain, is that most of them get cut and the material gets left on the verge. And as a result of that, what happens is the, um, the, 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 the grass rots, the fertility returns to the soil, and it grows more grass, which then smothers the wildflowers. So anything that's taken by the farmer is going to help that situation. The only way it will not help that situation is if the rainfall and the deposition from the air contains more nutrients than the farmer is taking off. So 
that the one thing to do, although it may sound slightly perverse, is to encourage the farmer to take the crop as early as possible. Because in the middle of the summer, say in early July, if that's the only time, if the farmer will only take it once, then if you take the grass in the middle of the growing season, that's when the maximum amount of nutrients are up in the grass and you will have the maximum capacity to remove those nutrients from the ground in that one cut. If you leave the cut till late on in the year into September, those nutrients have naturally been returned by the plants to the roots and so you will remove all the, the thatch, the dead material, but you won't be removing as many nutrients. So if it's only one cut a year, then the timing is all important. Um, and, and my suggestion is to try and get that as early as possible and then you know, as the wildflowers come on, then to make that a bit later in the year if you can. Um, I hope that helps. Um, in these really low fertility conditions, do you need to increase plug planting per square meter? Oh, right. No, you don't. The wonderful thing about these really, really low fertility conditions is, is um, I, I mean, I think if you look up on the commercial websites, it'll probably say, I don't know, five, sometimes even 10 grams of wildflower seed per square meter. On the Weymouth Relief Road, simply to keep the cost down, I was sowing at two grams of wildflower seed per square meter. And that's a tiny quantity, that's barely a handful. Um, and what happens is that when these flowers flower and they set seed, that seed is good quality seed and it falls onto ground that's got lots of gaps in it and so it's self-perpetuating. And the fact that the Weymouth Relief Road was sown in 20, 2009, 2010 and, and those wildflowers are just keeping going year in, year out without anybody doing anything is, is, is manifest, shows you just how powerful this, um, this uh, approach can be. Um, it is remarkable, but you don't need much much to kick start the process and then sit back and let nature take its course. Oh, here's interesting yellow rattle. Does yellow rattle work as a way to reduce grass competition? Um, uh, or is it missing the point of reducing fertility? Well, Andrew, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, yellow rattle works best when fertility is already being reduced. So if you put yellow rattle into a really fertile soil, um, you have to work very hard for that yellow rattle to grow. Yellow rattle germinates in the spring after it's been wintered in the weather. So it needs a, a bit of a frost and cold conditions to get it to germinate. If you look at most fertile grasslands, over the winter, the grass keeps growing. And so by the spring, there's no light to enable the yellow rattle to germinate. So if you've cleared a fertile grassland harshly in the late autumn and sowed the yellow rattle, then there's every good chance yellow rattle will come up in the spring and start to get to work on the grass roots and suck the life out of those roots so that the grass doesn't grow as strong. But it's so, so much more effective and so much easier if you've already got a, a grassland that's already um, been been defertilized. It's already had nutrients removed, and then there are enough open spaces that you don't have to work hard to get the yellow rattle to germinate. Once yellow rattle is in the system in a fairly low fertile condition, it works with you very very well indeed. Um, it's it's more patchy than a cut and collect because yellow rattle tends to come up in some areas some years and other areas another, but it's a lovely plant to have. But in my view, it's it's an aid rather than a solution. Uh, what success have you had in persuading local authorities and town councils to invest in cut and collect machinery? I know one problem is having somewhere to compost the waste. Um, uh, so it's interesting to see how quickly the fertility drops and therefore the amount of cuttings is reduced to very low levels. Very good, Tim. Um, uh, I've had some success. So Cornwall Council have got um, cut and collect mows, South Gloucestershire Council, Medway Council, um, uh, St Andrews um, Botanic Gardens are doing it. Scattered around this country are some councils that are either Buckinghamshire Council or about next spring to start trials. Uh, TFL uh, were 
starting trials this year, but I think they've had to be delayed till next year. I'm out and about talking to local authorities all the time and I'm getting uh, good responses, um, but it does take time for change. And some of that time is about investment in machinery because the machinery is at least twice as expensive as a standard mower. And some of it is about reluctance to go down the route because of this disposal <coughs> of arisings. What I uh, have encouraged the staff to do in Dorset Council was to dispose of the arisings as close to where they were cut as possible. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> that is, um, you know, if they've cut them on the verge and there's a hedgerow or an area of bramble or a new planting area, tree planting area, then put the grass arisings in that area. So effectively, you move the grass arisings around from where you've cut them to somewhere very, very close by. And that system is now uh, working across Dorset in all of the towns where there is cut and collect. And that also means that it remains legal to be able to place those arisings on the road verges, because if the material is cut on the road verge and disposed of on that road verge, then it is not a waste. So it doesn't require any licensing. So it's very simple. Much as I would love to do something more useful than those arisings, I don't think it's um, that bad an effort to be able to encourage those arisings to be used as a mulch to grow trees and shrubs, which of course then convert into above ground carbon, so the carbon storage. So effectively, we're moving the nutrients around in the system. I talked to the local authorities about that. What I would say is Highways England have got it. And I think they're very keen to be able to move forward on that as soon as possible. But uh, big organisations do take a while to change. But I'd be very optimistic that in five years time, uh, we will see a sea change in the way that um, uh, grasses are being mown in parks and verges and indeed on lawns too. And um, <coughs> uh, are hedgerows problematic to creating low fertility road verges? Oh, well, um, I, I think probably not, Katrina. Um, uh, I, I think if we've got very, you know, quite wide hedges and thin strips of grass next to those hedges, then there, then there can be a bit of a conflict. <clears throat> but overall, um, hedges are sucking up nutrients as well as as well as um, um, uh, grasses and herbs, and and so. If those hedges do grow, then they are taking some of the nutrients away that we want. Um, they do cast shadow. And obviously, when the hedgerow gets cut, then all the bits drop onto the grassland. So there is some potential for conflict there. Um, I think my view is to be able to um, create uh, or, or to maintain verges where you've got space where you're not trying to cram everything into too tiny a space on, in, in parks. So if you're going to create your wildflower area, then, then try not to do it underneath the trees. Try and do it in an open ground where you're most likely to be able to have full control of what you're doing. That would be my, my suggestion on that. OK, right. So well, I'm now to the end of the questions. We've just gone 7 o'clock. Um, um, I think, uh, I think, Rafe, is that, have I now come to the end of my time? Questions? Um, I think that's probably it, isn't it? Super. Well, look, um, it's been my pleasure to be able to present to you this evening, and I hope my uh, answers to your questions have been um, helpful. I can see that uh, many of you have enjoyed what I've said and useful and inspiring. Um, it's been great pleasure to talk to you this evening and uh, I wish you well. And for those of you who are down in Eastbourne, I, I promise I will come and see you in 2021 and um, in, enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, let's let's see in a, in a couple of years time how how Eastbourne are doing. But we will look forward to seeing you very much. Super. Thank you. Bring the flowers with you. I will do that. Thank you. Thanks. Cheerio now. Good night. <laughs>